So in the midst of Black Lives Matter protests following the shooting of Jacob Blake in the back about seven times, uh, the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others, the issue of anti-black uh, bias among police is being brought up. Uh, and there's a new report out that seems to justify some of our worst fears about that. So now the Brennan Center for Justice recently released a report on Thursday on the presence of not uh, just implicit bias against African-Americans when policing, but explicit bias and racism. So it's not just like, oh, we've got a you know slight bias against African-Americans because we think they're a little bit more prone to crime. Uh, but no, it's like, no, we hate African-Americans. Hmm. Hmm. So now the Brennan Center for uh, fellow and former FBI special agent Michael German wrote this in his report. While it is widely acknowledged that racist officers subsist within police departments around the country, federal, state and local governments are doing far too little to proactively identify them, report their behavior to prosecutors who might unwittingly rely on their testimony in criminal cases or to protect the diverse communities they are sworn to serve. This is all too true. Uh, so now you've got racist policing. And it oftentimes gets swept under the rug and completely ignored. Or, of course, you justify uh, with stats like 1350, right? So now, 1350. Uh, a lot of right-wingers talk about this, right? Uh, so it's basically based on crime stats, right? So now, those crime stats, you got to understand that that's a lot, uh, partly at least, a result of socioeconomic factors, you also have the issue of over-policing in minority areas. You also have issues of systemic racism and bias in policing and other things. Uh, and so when you actually look at the context, when you actually look at the factors of 1350 and what creates that, well, then it's a lot more easy to understand why this happens in these communities. But the going back to the report here, uh, efforts to address systemic and implicit biases in law enforcement are unlikely to be effective in reducing racial disparities in the criminal justice system as long as explicit racism in law enforcement continues to endure. There is ample evidence to demonstrate that it does. And so why? Why is that? How did police get racist? Well, at this point, it's kind of by design. I mean, according to the report hidden by plain sight, police officers with alleged ties to white supremacist groups or far-right militias have been identified in states including Alabama, California, Connecticut, Oregon, uh, Florida, Illinois, Michigan, Texas, Virginia, and Washington. And so, look, uh, a lot of our policing, by the way, is also based off of old uh, slave patrols, which, of course, were trying to reclaim lost property, that property being human beings, uh, African-Americans specifically. Uh, so now German's report points to evidence that law enforcement agencies have sympathy as a result of all of this, for if not direct ties to far-right militias and white supremacist groups. And that's, of course, what we've seen in Kenosha. I mean, you guys, I showed you evidence. This is cell phone video uh, of police telling armed white people that they appreciated their presence and then handing them bottled water when they were dealing with protesters. Uh, so one of the people in the video, by the way, was Kyle Rittenhouse, the teen that's charged with killing two unarmed Black Lives Matter protesters. Then you had uh, Kenosha Police Chief Daniel Miskinis uh, saying this uh, on camera. Everybody involved was out after the curfew. I'm, I'm not going to make a great deal of that, but the point is the curfew is in place to protect. Had persons not been out involved in, in violation of that, perhaps the situation that, that unfolded would not have happened. Um, so the last night, a 17-year-old individual from Antioch, Illinois, was involved in the use of firearms to reserve, to, excuse me, to, uh, to resolve whatever conflict was in place. The result of it was two people. All right, so, hey, uh, protesters, it's your fault. Uh, it's your fault two of you got murdered. Shouldn't have been there. Okay, but that, wait a minute here. Uh, but what about the white militiamen? Uh, did they not also break curfew? Did Kyle Rittenhouse not also break the law by being a 17-year-old uh, with a long gun uh, illegally? Because you have to be 18, I believe, in Wisconsin to be able to open carry uh, and 21 in Illinois to be able to uh, possess firearm. 
And not only that, but you also went over state lines illegally. Weird. Uh, but no, they, they, they don't go after that. In fact, they go and give them water and say, I can't believe uh, you're here. We appreciate you so much. Okay. And then not only that, but you also had, uh, and this is a clip from a couple of years ago, uh, 2018, from Kenosha Sheriff David Beth saying this. I think society has to come to a thresh threshold where there's some people that aren't worth saving. We need to build warehouses to put these people into it and lock them away for the rest of their lives. Let's put them in jail. Let's, let's stop them from truly, at least some of these males going out and getting 10 other women pregnant and having small children. Let's put them away. At some point, we have to stop being politically correct and I don't care what race, I don't care how old they are. If there's a threshold that they cross, these people have to be warehoused. No recreational time in the jails. So, of course, that's in reference to uh, a group of black people who stole from a store, shoplifted, right? Throw them away for life because they did some shoplifting. Uh, look, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have some sort of consequences for that, but like, shoplifting and then of course getting into an accident which unfortunately uh, unfortunately hurt someone else again there needs to be consequences for that but you want to throw them away for the rest of their lives instead of rehabilitation that's i thought that, that's supposed to be the whole point of the prison system is to rehabilitate people so they can get back into society and become productive members but in this case no they don't believe in that no a lot of these police believe that some people are beyond worth saving and so therefore should be locked up for the rest of their lives I don't agree with that. And by the way, that is just in one city. Okay. Now, police in states, including California, Oregon, and Illinois, are currently being investigated for their alleged connections to far-right groups that oppose the Black Lives Matter movement. With many law enforcement officers engaging in overtly racist activities in public, on social media, or over law enforcement-only communication channels in internet chat rooms. Earlier this year, an officer in Salem, Oregon, was caught on video asking heavily armed white men dressed like militia to step inside a building or sit in their cars while police arrested protesters. The officer said he made the request, quote, so we don't look like we're playing favorites. But you are playing favorites. You're helping them out and saying, oh, look, I know you're out here uh, just like the protesters, right? And they have a you know, they, they, of course, should be able to uh, counter protest if they want. That's an American freedom, right? If you want to show up, you want to counter protest Black Lives Matter, who cares? Oh, but if you're going to get special, uh, you know, special treatment from the police because they agree with you, well, that's a problem. Okay, that's a big problem. Uh, officials in Olympia, Washington, also opened an investigation to an officer who posed for a photograph with a heavily armed far-right militia group called the 3% in Washington, allegedly after the officer thanked the group for guarding a shopping center. Again, showing how property is valued more than human lives. So, yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear that officers have, you know, uh, or I should say police, have been infiltrated by white supremacist groups and that there are a lot of officers who are at least adjacent to that, right, that are, that are friendly uh, to these people, right? And so understand that that makes sense. And it, and it tracks with the history of racism in this country. I mean, for example, members of the Klan were lawyers, doctors, legislators, and so on, uh, and so on in the South. Their purpose, by the way, was to intimidate black people into not exercising their constitutional rights, specifically the one to vote. So they wanted to stop people from voting. And we see that today, by the way. For example, arresting black people at much higher rates than white people and giving them harsher sentences for similar crimes, including prison time, uh, which in 21 states, if you're a felon, well, you lose your right to vote. That's also why they're criminalizing protests in Tennessee, for example, right? Where, oh, if you protest on public land or you camp on public land during a protest, which Black Lives Matter is doing, well, then, I mean, yeah, we're going to throw you in prison for six years and then we're going to take away your right to vote. So you can't vote in change. Uh, and it's also why same right-wing groups and police send agitators in to stoke violence 
and do property damage so that then the police themselves can act against it. See, this is why simple reforms, I don't believe are going to fix the cops right down to their DNA, to their origins. There is racism built in. On top of that, right, the Brennan Center, uh, I should say on that, the Brennan Center suggests that in addition to working to end implicit bias in policing, agencies must establish mitigation plans when overt racism is detected in their ranks. And we don't do that. This doesn't happen. Now, what it... What does he mean by mitigation plans? Uh, German writes that mitigation plans could include referrals to internal affairs, which I don't know if would be effective, local prosecutors, too much linked to the police, uh, or the DOJ, which is under William Barr, uh, for investigation and prosecution, termination, or other disciplinary action. I just already showed you, uh, you know, some examples or referred to you some examples of why that approach wouldn't work right now. Because already you have a Justice Department that is adjacent to white supremacy. (laughs) Uh, William Barr is not a friend to Black Lives Matter uh, or any any sort of group like that. Okay, Uh, again, internal affairs. We don't know who makes up internal affairs might be the best opportunity. Uh, But then you have local prosecutors who, again, work with police officers. So they're not going to go against the police. And so. None of these things are really going to be all that effective. Now, the report also called on the FBI. Oh, sorry. uh, Before I do that, um, some of the, uh, I guess, results of doing the first part uh, were to limit assignments to reduce potentially problematic conduct with the public, police retraining, intensified supervision, and auditing. And also then calls on the FBI to determine whether it's domestic terrorist investigations involving white supremacists uncover any connections to law enforcement and whether police officers investigated for civil rights violations have connections to violent white supremacist organizations or their far right militant groups have a record of dis- uh, discriminatory behavior or have a history of posting explicitly racist commentary in public or on social media. He says the most effective way for law enforcement agencies to restore public trust and prevent racism from influencing law enforcement actions is to prevent, I'm sorry, is to prohibit individuals who are members of white supremacist groups who have a history of explicitly racist conduct from becoming law enforcement officers in the first place or from remaining officers once bias is demonstrated. Again, I think we're, I think we're too far from that. I, I think, I mean, at some point, maybe this would have worked. Maybe, but I think it's too far. I, I think we need to do something more radical. We start by defunding, right? Uh, defunding police and using that money, of course, to solve some of the social ills that actually you know, start crime. Uh, doesn't mean no police. It means reduced budget for the police so they can learn to work with less and not do all the things right now that police do and do poorly. Uh, And also, I think, tear it down and start over again. You've got to start over again, fire everybody, do thorough investigations and whether or not these people are members of white supremacist groups, because, you know, if they are, they're not going to take the law fairly. They're not going to, you know, uh, protect the communities that they're supposed to protect and instead attack, suppress and exploit those communities uh, of color. And so we need to change that. We need to fix that. And small reforms around the edges. And this, of course, what frustrates me about uh, Joe Biden and the Democrats is that they're never going to do such things because they're as thin blue line and support the police as anyone else, as anyone on the Republican side. They're just a little less cracking people's heads open. And so there has to be major reforms. And unfortunately, members of both parties right now are not interested in taking uh, charge in these necessary reforms. And so what we're going to do is just get a little bit of change around the edges and nothing's really going to change for the most part, which should be very, very concerning. 